And Rico, I just really want to uh, express a gratitude um, for your time today. Um, it's so nice to be in conversation with you. We've known each other a long time. Um, in the gallery, you'll see we have students from both uh, my community organizing theory and practice class and then my colleague Leah Maricor's uh, public writing class. So we've all read some of your work and really look forward to uh, engaging you today. And I want to turn it over now to Dale, a student in the community organizing class, who's going to do the introduction. I'll pose a couple of questions to you, and then we're going to turn it back over to the students. So thank you so much, Rinko. Right. Sounds great. Hi, it's so nice to have you here today. Um, my name is Dale, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm Sakit. I use he, him pronouns. And we too will be interesting um, introducing you to the, um, to the class today. So um, we're so honored and excited to invite Rinku Sen to our community organizing theory and practice course today in collaboration with Professor Maricor's public writing course. Rinku Sen has been leading efforts for racial justice for over 30 years as a longtime political strategist and writer, co-president co of the Women's March Board of Directors, former president and executive director of Race Forward, and publisher of their award-winning news site, Color Lines. Rinku also received a BA in Women's Studies from Brown and went to Columbia University to receive an MS in Journalism. Rinku's work has helped redefine how we think about systemic racism and has made issues of social justice and community organizing accessible to a much wider public. Under her leadership, Race Forward worked to advance racial justice through research, identifying issues that plague our society and possible solutions, media highlighting the stories of marginalized people and action, focusing on mobilization and leadership development training. Some of the groundbreaking projects from Rinku's time at Race Forward included Drop the I Word, I Word, which pushed media outlets to stop referring to immigrants as illegal, as well as the Shattered Families Report, which identified numbers of children in foster care with deported parents. Rinkusen's writing and her approach to social justice work were directly relevant to the topics we have discussed in this course, including issues like models for successful organizing and social change, as well as the intersection of race, class, and gender in community organizing work. She's also the author of two books, Stir It Up, Lessons in Community Organizing and Advocacy, and The Accidental American. She writes in the, preface, in the preface of Stir It Up that she, like many of us in this course today, experienced organizing for the first time on her college campus. Um, and in Accidental American, she advocates for treating immigrants as free, immigration as a free and natural flow of labor that matches the flow of capital and a new approach to globalization that allows countries to e equitably benefit from a mobile labor, uh, from a mobile labor force. We also read three articles by Rinku Sen for class today, and in them she draws from her experience in direct action and anti-racist work, as well as her identity as an Indian American woman and an immigrant who has devoted herself to building multiracial coalitions, fighting for racial justice, and the contradictions that exist within these identities. We've also seen in within her article um, on mutual aid that Rinku's work is deeply informed by a history by history, yet constantly adapting to the relevant context and the current movements. So thank you again so much for joining us today. We're really excited to learn from you. Thank you, really excited to see all of you. And always happy to see my friend, Dan Jose. Okay, thanks so much. And are you doing well today, Rin? Um, it's a little crazy two weeks before the election, but um, my my spirits are okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you're, and you're joining us from Elmhurst, from your home in Queens? I'm in New York. I split my time between Queens and Round Rock, Texas, which is a little bit outside of Austin, um, but I'll be going back to Texas next week to vote, hopefully early. Great. Okay. Okay. Welcome again. I'm just gonna pose a quick question to um, kind of get us going and then I'll turn it back over to the students. Um, so we read this uh, piece uh, from Color Lines that I've actually used in several classes I think in the last 10 years are immigrants and refugees, people of color. Um, I was hoping, so it, it has this great um, line in the end where you ask, quote, so are immigrants and refugees, people of color, to my eye most are, but it's not ultimately, ultimately for me to decide no matter what though, immigration policy itself is about race and color as well as nationality and class. 
whether immigrants themselves feel like people of color or not. And I'm wondering if you could just say a bit about what led you to um, kind of write this piece, the intervention you wanted to make with it. And in particular, the, this idea that immigrate, immigrant rights policies could somehow be pursued without an analysis of race um, and, and kind of where that came from. Yeah, um, I wrote that piece after I had done a training in Seattle for a um, uh, immigrant and refugee organization. And the people in the training were um, mostly refugees, um, Somali, um, some Middle Eastern Arab refugees, and a um, couple of other folks. And, um, and it was a racial equity training. That's what I had been hired to do. And when I started to do it, um, people said, well, we don't really see how this is relevant to us because we're not people of color, we're not racial. Um, we came from a place where everybody was like us. And so we don't, we don't think of the world in race terms. And so, you know, nice to hear you, but not all that interested and um and i had a little argument with them you know about that asked them a little more about what they were thinking and then i wrote that piece and um i think what i what i meant to say is so um that last line you know can you make remake immigration policy without a race analysis you can't but you can make it you can still have the race analysis, even if all of the people affected um, and implicated in that analysis don't identify as racialized people. Um, I mean, we do that all the time with white people. They don't think of themselves as a race, many, many, many white people. And yet we talk about white privilege and white advantage and um, white poverty and whiteness. So. So um, the analysis and the identity are not the same thing. And um, they're related, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and yeah, ultimately no one should be telling anyone else how to um, identify. But I do think our identities change over time. And sometimes they change because we see somebody else who looks like us who has adopted some identity that we haven't yet. Just a, a quick follow-up to that. So that uh, piece talks about your political formation as an undergraduate at Brown. Then you move to the West Coast. Um, you spend probably 20 years in the Bay Area in Oakland. So I'm wondering if you could talk at, a, at an organization we both worked for, the Center for the Third World Organizing, about what that formation was like, especially in the 1990s in the Bay Area, and how it shaped your own consciousness around race, immigration, and politics. Yeah, I had grown up on the East Coast. Uh, I'm an immigrant. We arrived in the States when I was five and a half, and I grew up in um, factory and middle class towns um, in the Northeast. And um, when I discovered C2, the Center for Third World Organizing, I was about three years into um, a life of college organizing and campus activism. Um, I had been training student organizers around the country for about a year at that point. And, um, and I was beginning to worry about um, where I would wind up after college and if it would, if that place where I wound up would continue, would help me continue on a journey of being in a multiracial community. So college was my first truly multiracial community. Everywhere I'd grown up had very few people of color. And, um, you know, I, I can remember one other Indian family um, in my high school. And I, I was really sold <laughs> from college uh, around the idea of, of living multiracially. And um, I went out to California to do our summer training and I just fell in love a lot with C2, with the staff there, with the trainers. Um, and it was the first time, Oakland was the first time I was in a place that had a, ma 
um, a substantial Asian population of any kind, East or South or Southeast. And, um, and it felt like home in a way that I had not experienced before. And in fact, I learned a lot from my um, Asian uh, colleagues and friends who grew up in California because their whole way of being was so different from mine. They were so um, unapologetic isn't a word we used in the 80s, but um, that's what they were and uh, radical and very deeply um, embedded in race politics. Um, the other thing though is I went through our summer program in 1987 and I joined the staff in 88. In 84, um, Jesse Jackson had run for president and um, you know, through the 80s been building the Rainbow Coalition. And C2 was very um, much a part of that um, rainbow solidarity um, ethic or ethos that, that was coming up in the late 70s. Um, yeah, so, so that just felt like where I was meant to be and where we could get a lot done um, for racial justice because we were together. Yeah, so I think it's, it's really interesting the ways of both, but like the place and just being deeply embedded in a place and then having access to its history um, also shapes, you know, the ideas where we can work with the experiences we have access to. Um, Fee, I want to invite you now to share your question with uh, Rinku and we'll hear a couple from our class and then turn it over to Professor Miracor's class. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for coming and for sharing your wisdom with all of us. Um, we loved your article on the 19th century roots of mutual aid which provides strong cause for hope that we're seeing a resurgence of mutual aid in the pandemic after this long history of state crackdowns on mutual aid societies and decades of pressure from philanthropists to separate direct service that addresses the symptoms of racism from anti-racist organizing. And so I was wondering what your thoughts are on how mutual aid movements can sustain this rediscovered radical mission and avoid the current traps of the nonprofit industrial complex, for instance, like if a community mutual aid network accumulates money and starts to manage it hierarchically or they hire staff or they decide they need official nonprofit status to receive protections from liability, how could we anticipate and counter that in mutual aid work? Well, the way I've seen a lot of people handle these contradictions is that they build different kind, they build different entities sometimes that have the same um, identity politically, but that have different tax, tax uh, regulations, sometimes different memberships, um, different uh, revenue sources, so that um, it's sort of like the big movement version of having a day job and having your organizing life, um, which I never experienced until three years ago when I left my job at Race Forward and didn't take another one, um, started consulting. And for the first time since I was like 19 or 20 years old, I was a volunteer again. Um, so I think, um, you know, those of us who are used to working in social change and getting, you know, making our living that way, um, we can have a lot of expectations of our organizations, but not every organization is meant to do everything. So, um, you know, I have a friend, Danny and I have a mutual friend actually, who in the 80s started a um, credit union, a cooperative credit union in Brooklyn, uh, largely black, um, doing, you know, great work, moving lots of money through. And they did get attacked um, by the system and uh, thwarted, but they had to have a hierarchy. They had to have, in order to run a bank, <laughs> you had to have a banker and you had to have somebody who was in charge. That is not the way um, that person runs his current organization, which is a direct action membership based organization. That organization is now trying to build a food co-op in Brooklyn. The food co-op will operate differently. And in an ideal world, you have there's a relationship between all these entities and some of the people are the same. So I think if mutual aid is gonna last, um, 
you know, for sure, some people are going to take advantage of the service framework and fundraising framework and raise money to, to do their mutual, um, to set up new systems. But the real beauty of mutual aid is that it's voluntary um, and um, no one's getting paid to give it to you. That's the idea. Um, and so I think we'll see, um, we'll see ongoing volunteerism. Freedom Inc., the organization I wrote about in that story, um, you know, they run a, they're a sophisticated operation. They run advocacy programs. They run a whole civic engagement program. They turn out voters. Um, but their food pantry is just for whoever brings them food and whoever needs food. So it's a very open-ended um, food system in an organization that does comport with tax law and um, other things. So you might have a day organization and a night organization, um, but I think that's how it'll get done through different and different formations. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I also had a question again. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, and we read a lot of what we were talking about earlier about your writing about what people of color as a formation means. Um, specifically, you had an article in The Nation where you described how when you first got involved in organizing, you kind of used this, we're all in the same boat language. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that that kind of fell apart, right? And I think that makes sense in that like, if the goal of organizing is to bring people together, I think a first instinct is maybe to focus on commonalities. Yeah, as you describe, um, without a meaningful analysis of difference and a way to relate across and navigate harm and conflict among those differences that can kind of like fall apart. Um, so my question is basically that, like um, how do we build multiracial coalition that is like relational without, you know, ignoring difference or just doing a very simple like us versus them analogy? Um, and then how do we create space for navigating harm and accountability that like difference inevitably creates? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, yes, what I've learned over time is that um, there are differences in the mechanisms uh, that through which people are oppressed <laughs> or harmed. Um, the, the actual mechanisms are different. So if you look at immigration, for example, um, the notion of um, making felonies deportable, making certain crimes deportable that wouldn't that would otherwise be minor crimes, that's not a thing that happens to US citizens um, or uh, born US born citizens. Uh, it is a thing that happens to naturalized citizens. Um, and I think the, what I figured out as being important is first to be able to acknowledge that there are differences in the mechanisms and also in the intensity and severity of what we experience at the hands of different institutions. Um, I think that it is possible to recognize difference uh, Difference in mechanisms is easy to recognize because people are like, yeah, okay, that's a different mechanism. Difference in severity is um, much more emotionally charged thing to recognize um, because you're saying either you're asserting that I or my people are experiencing more severe harm or someone else is experiencing more severe harm. And once you get into the, once you get to like having to measure severity, then um, it feels like you're on the road to your alliance falling apart. But what uh, the theory I'm working with now is that actually alliance is the wrong framework for us to be able to move forward on solving the problems we have to solve. And um, a more promising framework is the fr framework of friendship and community. And um, and that's a pretty underdeveloped framework, I think, in US social justice movements. Um, but if I look at my own life and look at history, um, it's, it's clear that there are groups of friends who move things together, who moved each other and then moved things. So, um, 
So I think that if you are friends and you work on a friendship, that it's much harder to walk away when you have political conflict, which almost always arises over um, the question of whether our alliance is going to hang together as the system tries to buy pieces of it off. Um, you know, if you're in an alliance and it's transactional, I mean, I think alliance, the definition of alliance is transactional. You trade things that you need for mutual benefit, um, but it might not be the exact same benefit. I might not get from our alliance what um, Maya gets from our alliance. But if you are friends or in community, your goal is for that whole community to grow. And then you have to figure out how different parts of it grow. Um, targeted universalism is still the best legal and policy theory for this, I think. Um, you have universal goals and targeted strategies that account for um, why the same kinds of activities or benefits won't have um, even effects that, that on, on top of history, um, discriminatory history, you might have to design different kinds of solutions for different communities. And I think for all of us, just being able to live with that reality that, um, that we, it's okay to design different solutions for different communities, that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it that um, I'm not totally sure how to get to yet is true universalism. If in fact you made um, welfare policy totally like not needs dependent, for example, you, you claim the need for food stamps, you get food stamps. That would um, make our system way more efficient and it would go around the um, thing that happens in the US where, um, you know, people wanna draw these lines about who deserves and who doesn't deserve. Um, so the way you don't have to figure that out is you just make the thing available for everybody. So um, those are a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, and harm and accountability. Um, you know, I think there have to be systems for that. It's, it's a lot to expect individuals to hold themselves accountable um, or even a group of individuals to do a good job of holding each other accountable. So I like to see what the structures are. I'm not opposed to hierarchy, but I want to know what the person at the top is actually supposed to be doing. And I wanna know what the person at the bottom is supposed to be doing and whether the system they're in supports them each playing their roles um, well. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm really opposed to is a lack of due process, including in organizations. Um, I have watched people um, who may or may not have had a problem, but I don't know because um, after the accusation, they just got fired and that was that. So I, I don't think that's enough process for social justice organizations um, when we feel like there's internal harm. Um, thank you, Melinda and Fee, for those questions and um, for those just really rich reflections. Um, do we have about five more minutes, Rinko, for you? Is that okay? Yes. Um, let me just text. Oh, I can't touch my phone. I just did. Um, let, yeah, I won't touch anything else now. Let me just text someone and tell them I'm going to be a little bit late. Okay. Um, and maybe, Professor Miracor, we could just stack the two questions, that your last two questions from your class together, um, and so that uh, Rinko can. Sure. I, I can just, I can call on um, um, Drew and Isiua and just ask that you guys, you know, limit your questions to a sentence and a half. And just um, why don't you pose them together? And then um, um, Rinku, thank you so much for answering them. So um, Drew, do you want to go first, please? And then it's you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so I was just wondering if you could um, talk more about how you believe your community organization, organization um, works in conjunction with your public writing. So how they complement and depend and maybe work distinctly from each other. Uh, yeah, so a lot of my public writing is meant to share lessons out of the organizing. Um, and I think some of it 
some of my public writing is also, um, I try to be brave about sharing things that I'm still figuring out and just saying, I'm still figuring this out. If you have a thought, please share it. Um, and the older I get, the more, um, the more speculative my writing is because now I really know what I don't know. <laughs> and so there's a lot to speculate on. Uh, when I was 20, I didn't really know that there was so much more to know. So, um, so um, I organize, I write, um, you know, the mutual aid stuff, that, that story came out of um, just living in New York and being an activist and um, trying to do my part to help people through the pandemic. Um, I think for me, um, it's not that writing is a form of organizing, it's not but it's a useful thing to be able to do if you are an organizer. Um, I'll tell you a really quick story. A about five years ago, I was on total burnout and um, my friends invited me to go on vacation with them to Hawaii. They are 65 and 70. So that should tell you something about my life that I go on vacation with a 65 year old and a 70 year old. Um, and we were talking one day, this was long before the 2016 election about the rise of uh, fascistic movements around the world and what would we do? What could we contribute if something like that happened here? And I said, oh, I just feel so pathetic. I can't really do anything. All I can do is write a good essay. I can't like grow plants or build houses or fix cars or shoot guns, anything that might be useful in a revolution all I can do is write a great essay. And my friend said, that is always useful. So <laughs> um, it's another way of being useful and um, uh, sharing and recruiting. Thanks so much. Is you, do you wanna take this next question quickly? Um, thank you so much for being with us and thanks for staying a bit longer. So how does the anti-Blackness of some immigrant communities in the US connect with broader histories of white supremacy and colorism, specifically um, you know, the case of discrimination against Dalits in India and discrimination against Afro-Latinx people in Latin America? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it feels like humanity has a darkness issue. It, it does not like dark skin. Human beings don't like dark skin. And I've gone back and forth in my life between thinking it doesn't matter where it started or how it started, or like, we don't have to go back that far. We don't have to understand that. We just have to deal with it now. Um, but it is so global um, everywhere. I, I'm, I'm Indian. I grew up listening to my aunties talk about my cousins and who was marriageable and who wasn't based on their skin tone. Um, I, um, you know, I have uh, really uh, good friends, uh, black friends who I've traveled around the world with and, you know, dealt with like the reactions of Asians and Europeans and Indians to my friends. Um, so I think we're looking at a, problem um, that is foundational to um, our species of humans. And that means that um, that means that it can't be changed just by policy alone. Um, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual and cultural and psychological shift that has to happen. Um, to stop vilifying dark skin. And I don't think, I think that means that we have to have spiritual, cultural and political um, strategies and solutions because um, certainly the political by itself is not gonna get the job done. 
Um, thank you for those questions. Thank you, Ringo. That was, you know, that's a, a really uh, provocative and just um, answer for us to think with um, as we go forward. So I know you have to run to another meeting. Really grateful. Thank you so much. And um, uh, really just appreciate your time today. Thank you, Rinku. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rinku. Okay.